Hello, my name is Brad Stanford and I am a senior FileMaker developer at Portage Bay Solutions. You can visit us on the web at portagebay.com. In this presentation, we're going to be talking about how to have successful software projects from the perspective of airline safety. We're in, a, in an amazing time period right now for U.S. airline safety, and from 2009 to 2018, we recorded an impressive nine-year stretch of fatality-free U.S. airline flights. And it's taken a lot of work to get there, so we're going to compare running a software business to running an airline and see if we can learn something useful. Now, of course, a little background is in order so you know who I am and where I'm coming from and why you might want to listen to me. I've been a FileMaker developer for about 20 years. I started with FileMaker Pro 4 and 5 and worked my way up through the other versions with the FileMaker Pro Bible at my side, like most of you. And I did that till I felt like I, was, I knew what I was doing, you know, enough to start contributing to the library of tips and tricks out there, with my favorite one being the U.S. State Buttons tip or trick. And what that was was a map of the 50 U.S. states all built out of FileMaker objects so that when you clicked on a state, the button highlighted correctly, not with that big giant dark rectangle around it that would otherwise be there if you just defined the shape as a, as a, uh, a button or if it was a graphic, let's say. So, uh, and you can see there I've clicked on Florida and it has painted beautifully with no spurious edges. Now, this hard work did not go unnoticed by the FileMaker community. The highest praise I received was, and I quote, this is the greatest solution in search of a problem I have ever seen. Yes, and armed with that kind of encouragement, I continued with my FileMaker career until I had enough experience to work with companies like Mighty Data and iSolutions and Full City Consulting with my final destination here at Portage Bay. Now, in comparison, I've been into aviation as long as I can remember. Suffice it to say, I used the 1978 made-for-TV movie The Winds of Kitty Hawk as my marker for when the aviation bug really bit me. I went on to get my airline dispatch certification, which is the exact same test that the airline pilots take, just without all the flight time. Dispatcher service flight planners and a captain on the ground during emergencies. Now, during this time, I also accumulated about 50 hours of gen general aviation flight time before the flight budget needed to be diverted into the raise a family budget. These days, I'm the part-time airport manager for Dublin, Texas, and this means that three or four days a week, I'm out at the airport office doing my programming out there, but occasionally serving as a one-man welcoming committee for pilots that decide to come visit our little town. The video you're seeing is me flying our recently acquired community flight simulator, which resides at said airport office. Now, this three-screen setup is from X-Force PC, and it's running X-Plane 11, and yes, my lunch breaks can be pretty fun. And this is my last actual landing from 2013 in the bumpy Texas summer air. And while the simulator is great practice, nothing comes close to the feeling of actual flight and saving your own bacon from the mistakes you made just a few moments before. Anyway, I know some stuff about FileMaker, I know some stuff about aviation, so let me connect the dots between the two and show you what we can learn from almost a decade of fatality-free airline operations in the U.S. One interesting thing about the aviation community is that we study aviation accidents very carefully so we can learn from the mistakes of those who've gone before us. The collection of accident investigation data has been super valuable to the aviation community and saved countless lives. But I think there's a greater data set that's going to change the way you do business. So let me show you some real numbers about airline safety. And specifically, I want to look at fatal airline crashes. While there are still fatalities on board airlines, the occurrence of an airliner crashing and causing fatalities has all but gone away here in the United States. That's amazing. This has been a multi-generational, multi-company effort to make that happen. If we analyze how such a monumental thing was accomplished, we're going to walk away knowing more about how accident prevention works and we can apply it to the analysis of our own projects over the years that have been the equivalent of fatal accidents. So, here we go into some numbers. Accidents involving passenger fatalities, U.S. Airlines, Part 121, 1982 to the present. Part 121, by the way, is the part of the Federal Code of Regulations that defines what airlines can, can't, and must do. I want us to notice three things about these numbers. First, I start with 1972. That was the year I was born. And there were more than 10 fatal crashes that year for U.S. Airlines. So 10 years later... 
it was less than half that amount. So by the 1980s, we've got a better data stack. We've started implementing changes. We're seeing the number of fatal airline crashes in the single digits. And progress was already being made. There was inertia in a positive direction. Also notice the data set for the 80s versus the 2000s. The statistical anomaly there is September 11th, 2001. Had it not been for that incident, there would have only been one fatal crash in 2001. And also notice in the 2000s, it's not every year we have some years missing there, like 2002 and 2007 and 8. Also notice the title of the chart is 1982 to the present, and there's nothing past 2009. That's because until Southwest Airlines Flight 1380 on April 17th, 2018, we had zero fatal accidents, and that is a really big deal. And the Southwest Airlines flight was technically not a crash. So by strict definition, that didn't end our record of fatality-free crashes. However, it did end the record of fatality-free flights over the previous nine years. Now to the uninitiated, the data looks straightforward. It just looks like we finally figured out what was causing crashes and the airlines changed what they needed to change to fix it. But it's far more complex than that. Accidents usually have an average of seven things that cause them. We call that the chain of events. If any link in that chain is broken, the accident doesn't happen. The unholy trinity of forces in aviation uh, consists of the FAA, the airlines, and the NTSB. Now, the FAA is the Federal Aviation Administration, and they define the rules of the game, but very slowly and, and inefficiently. The airlines play the game with the main goal of maximizing profits. And the NTSB, or the National Transportation Safety Board, is an independent organization that watches both groups, makes recommendations, and then weeps as nothing gets done. So let's take an NTSB recommendation and see how that plays out in real life. The NTSB would like all aircraft to have cameras in the cockpit recording the entire flight. Now, despite what you're seeing here, the FAA does not like unapproved electronics to be used in the cockpit during flight. And as far as I can tell, the FAA has not approved visual recording devices as the NTSB would prefer. Now, I don't know what the regulations were that allowed things like this to, uh, to happen because they're happening all the time these days. But I know it's not mandated by the FAA for airlines to have these cameras. So if they did mandate that, wh what would it look like? Well, the airlines will immediately look at this from a cost perspective. How much will it cost for an FAA approved camera and black box for data storage? And then once installed, it's one more system that could break and keep the airplane from flying. So that's possible lost revenue. The FAA regulations were written during a time where this wasn't even a consideration, much less possible. So now we have to have new regulations drawn up. They have to be voted on, amended to the current rules. How much will that cost? How long will it take? And is it safe? Uh, the attachments, the associated wiring harnesses, recording devices, they all have to be tested to make sure that they're not safety risks as well. Who pays for that and how long will that take? So these are just a few of the problems that come up with an NTSB suggestion. Think of it this way. The NTSB could request fireproof seats, but it's cheaper for an airline to pay out a possible lawsuit after a crash than to put in seats made of fireproof material. So when we talk about fatality-free years, we're talking about airline CEOs, CFOs, pilots, mechanics, crew members, ramp workers, the FAA, airport managers, and the NTSB all getting along to do something together. Thousands of different people over a long period of time working under the same assumptions and rules together to accomplish one thing. Now that is a project. So what can we learn from this monumental effort about project management? Well, we can look at what it takes to make a safe flight these days and apply that to a project. So the first thing, you must have a starting point and an ending point. Open-ended airline flights with no declared destination are not allowed. You must then gather resources to get from the starting point to the ending point. So the aircraft, fuel, oxygen, crew, food, drinks, entertainment, and maybe collect some passengers. That might help. Uh, you have to make sure that the aircraft can make the trip. We have a thing called the minimum equipment list. Uh, the MEL. So if a broken item is not in the MEL, 
then you don't get to fly the airplane. So if your coffee pot breaks and you open the MEL and there is no instruction on what to do with a broken coffee pot, the aircraft is grounded. Next, you must make sure that the atmosphere is conducive for traveling. Weather, of course, is the biggest factor. Do the circumstances outside the aircraft allow for travel? What about any temporary flight restrictions? What about notices to airmen? And that's just a list of um, safety-related information about a given airport. So uh, if there is a construction crane nearby to the runway, that'll be in the notices to airmen. Um, if there's a runway closure or some lights aren't working, all of that's in notices to airmen. Now, you must make sure that those who are taking the trip want to go through everything required to take the journey. Did you get your passport, your ticket? Are you sober? Are you sane? Are you on the no-fly list? Are you trying to bring your guide ostrich on board? All of these things. What about your health issues these days? All of those things um, are wrapped into can a passenger make the journey? So let's take these examples and apply them to a project. What's the start point and end point? How do you know you've done what your client or boss has asked you to do? What's the high five we can go home moment? Have you collected your resources in advance? And first of all, money in the client's bank is like fuel in the airplane's tank. Uh, do you have an, a liaison on the client side that is your go-to person for all issues? If there's a project manager, and I hope there is, are they committed to the project or stretched across so many that you'll never see them except at the meetings? All right, the atmosphere. Is the weather outside the project itself good? What is the attitude of the CEO, the CFO, the IT department, other uh, stakeholders? Has it been made clear to everyone this is to spec or is this agile? Have you made as sure as you can that either the weather's not going to change or you have contingencies in place to get around it. And then, can the client make this trip? Are they already so swamped with their day-to-day -day operations that they can't even answer an email about having a meeting to discuss the project? If so, they are not ready for this trip. Now, here are the causes of fatal accidents from 1950 to 2010. And I'll just give you some brief explanations here. Uh, starting in the top left where it says pilot error 32%. Pilot error is when a pilot makes a mistake or a bad decision. Mechanical issues are next, and that's either caused by poor maintenance, faulty parts, or by a heretofore unexpected materials failure of some kind. The next, next one is pilot error related to weather, and this means that the pilot made a mistake or bad decision about how to handle the weather at the time. And then weather by itself means that it was something the pilot was unaware of or a sudden condition that was unavoidable. Now other is on the right-hand column there, and there, there's a whole list of factors there considered others, such as air traffic control errors or improper aircraft loading, runway obstructions, stuff like that. Then there's sabotage, whether that's by someone on the ground before the flight took off or by someone on board, it's all categorized as sabotage. Now, if you add the two pilot error categories together, you have 48% of accidents caused by pilot error. And that's a lot of percents attributed to human factors. So said another way, human decision-making under stressful and unfamiliar conditions is the main cause of accidents. Let me say that again. Human decision-making under stressful and unfamiliar conditions is the main cause of accidents. Now, the solution is training and procedures. Those are made to minimize the conditions in which the pilot is either stressed or in unfamiliar conditions. Procedures allow everyone to know what normal is so we can recognize what a deviation from normal is. And when there is a deviation from normal, training gives you the tools to handle it. Now, what if you found out that one of these reasons is why you were involved in a plane crash? Less than minimum flight planning, so the pilots just planned enough to get off the ground but hardly anything else. Or, during the flight, they hardly or never looked at their instruments. Uh, the pilot and co-pilot didn't speak the same language, and that kept them from working together. How would you feel about that? Or, there wasn't enough money to maintain the airplane or fuel it properly, so it crashed. 
what if it was the crew didn't follow the planned route of flight? And so without going to any destination in particular, they just flew until you ran out of fuel. Or what if nobody cared? Pilots really didn't care if the flight was safe. Well, would, do you think you would judge that company or those pilots a little harshly for that, that mess up? Well, guess what? Those are all the leading causes of software project failures. If we can judge those guys and those companies on the previous slide for crashing, then we should have no trouble doing the same for our own industry. And just like the airlines, it should motivate us to work together to have the happiest clients on the planet. In fact, they should be so impressed with how smooth our work is that they find an excuse to do another project with us. Now, as the data shows, the airlines have been able to mostly overcome the causes of their project failures. Proof of this is the water landing of U.S. Airways Flight 1549, otherwise known as the Miracle on the Hudson. Sully Sullenberger on the left and Jeff Skiles were the pilots of that flight. And when they asked Sully about how such a feat was accomplished, he responded, One way of looking at this might be that for 42 years, I've been making small, regular deposits in this bank of experience, education, and training. And on January 15th, the balance was sufficient so that I could make a very large withdrawal. I love that. Now we'll talk about training later, but I want you to focus on one particular aspect of that training called Cockpit Resource Management. Cockpit Resource Management assures that everyone in the flight crew is free to speak up whenever they feel it, it's necessary. And that means a first-year co-pilot can call into question the decisions of a 30-year veteran captain because that's the safest way for a flight crew to operate. The other part of cockpit resource management, though, is what the name implies, using the resources at your disposal wisely. In this case, Sully was the pilot in command, which means he was ultimately responsible for the safety of flight. But Jeff was the pilot flying on this particular flight. He was holding on to the controls and moving the airplane. So Sully ends up switching roles with Jeff right in the middle of their emergency. Now, Sully had more experience in the airplane than Jeff, and he was the better choice for who should be handling the flying during the emergency, and that's why he made that call. But let's look at the actual transcript of the incident, and I'll point out three lessons I think we can learn from it. Now, we're going to pick up where Sully and Jeff have just taken off. Hot 1 indicates Sully talking, and Hot 2 indicates that Jeff is talking, and that just means a hot mic. So, hot mic position number one, hot mic position number two. So Sully starts off by saying, oh, what a view of the Hudson today. Jeff agrees. Then Jeff says, flaps up, please, after takeoff checklist. Sully responds, flaps up, after takeoff checklist complete. Now, checklists are everything in aviation. If you want a truly safe project, have checklists for everything. How to start a project, how to end one, how to add a feature in the middle, how to run a meeting. And only deviate from those checklists and procedures when you must. Now, whether that's practical or not, that's up for us to decide and discuss later, but let's keep reading. So Sully says, birds. He sees them. Jeff says, whoa. And then there's the sounds of the thumping of all the birds. And Jeff says, oh, blank. And Sully says, oh, yeah. And Jeff says, uh-oh. Those are all appropriate responses to the situation that's unfolding. Now Sully immediately says, we got one roll, both of them rolling back, and he means that the engines are slowing down. He's immediately communicating to the pilot about his airplane. And Sully's playing the role of co-pilot right now, right? So he's communicating, he informs the pilot about um, what's going on, and then he also says, here's what I'm doing to, to either correct or try and fix part of the problem. He says, ignition start, I'm starting the APU. Now the APU is the auxiliary power unit. He's just indicated to Jeff that he is doing what's necessary to maintain power to the controls and the instruments. Now this next highlighted part, if, if you take nothing else away from this presentation, take this. At 1527, 23.2, Sully says, my aircraft. And at 1527, 24, Jeff says, your aircraft. Now, in flight training, the very first thing that you learn is when the instructor says, my aircraft, you stop touching everything immediately and without question. And notice the command and response style communication. In two words, Sully says, I am taking over controlling of the aircraft, and you may now resume your duties as first officer. 
And then in two words, Jeff responds, I understand that you are now responsible for controlling the aircraft and I'm switching roles to support you in that endeavor. So the question is, do you have a clear-cut way to indicate a transfer of responsibility in your project. They did this in the middle of an emergency. They communicated all of those thoughts with four words in 0.8 seconds. Okay? Do you have an unmistakable way of communicating what role you're in, what responsibilities you have? Could you pass responsibility that clearly in a project? This could change everything for the way we do projects if, if we have a common language to address who is responsible for what. Now, finally notice that the reason that anyone quote-unquote has the airplane to begin with is so that we always have someone who is responsible for flying the airplane, and we'll look at that here in a second. And lastly, I've highlighted get the QRH loss of thrust on both engines. And again, a very quick communication. Sully has told Jeff, pull out the checklist that's next to you, uh, look in it to see if there is any uh, guidelines on how to handle the loss of thrust in both engines. Okay, so now that's training. What do you do in an emergency? Grab a checklist. Look for help. Okay, now of course there wasn't any procedure for two engines out, so they, they invented some. But the point is that procedures and training carried through this whole thing, and that's why they were able to have a successful water landing. Now, back to the phrase, my airplane. Why must we always have someone who is responsible for flying the airplane? Because of accidents like Eastern Airlines Flight 401. Now, accidents, uh, I, I've said before, have an average of seven causes. We call this the accident chain because if any one of those links are broken, the accident doesn't happen. So in this case, we actually do have seven events leading up to this accident. Now it starts with the nose gear indicator light. They were getting ready to land and they put the gear down and the light indicated that the nose gear was not down and locked. Now the whole crew focused on that problem as it could be quite serious. So uh, as they're processing this problem, the pilot turns to talk to the flight engineer who's behind him over his right shoulder, which means, you know, he, he steadied himself with his left hand against the control column. Now, when he did that, the, the airplane was on autopilot. It was just going to stay at the current altitude. But he accidentally bumped the switch that changed the autopilot mode from altitude hold to pitch hold. So in other words, he told the airplane, don't stay at one altitude, just keep the nose pointed in the direction I tell you to. And since he bumped it a little bit forward, the nose dropped below the horizon a little bit and started to descend. Now, he didn't hit the button hard enough to get the full voltage through the electronics that would have alerted the co-pilot, hey, the autopilot mode has changed, right? So there's just enough spark to change the mode but not cause the alert. So as they're all working this problem, no one cha uh, noticed the change in altitude. They were flying at night over the Florida Everglades. And because they were so focused on the problem and they were all out of their seats, no one heard the altitude alert warning horn. And this whole time, no one was flying the airplane because they were relying on the autopilot. Eventually, they crashed into the Florida Everglades. In all, 75 survived the crash, 67 of the 163 passengers, and 8 of the 10 flight attendants survived. And here's a little tiny thing that we learned from this incident and a rules change that came from this. The flight attendants, once, once it had crashed uh, and, and people were getting out, they had to remind everyone not to light matches to see in the dark because if there was any spilled jet fuel there, they might explode the whole thing. And this is because at that time, flashlights were not required equipment on airplanes. So if you ever see a flashlight on an airplane, you can thank this accident for that regulation. So, situational awareness. Who makes sure that attention is being given to the right parts of the project at the right time? Is there a place where both your company and your client can see a roster of who is in charge of what for each project? Is one very important thing distracting from all the other important things, and how would you know if you were distracted or not? So we have 
tools, FileMaker Pro, Basecamp, Trello, Teamwork, I mean, a live webcam on a piece of paper on a wall. There are many ways we can make sure everyone can tune into the same situational awareness. And if we're in the business of helping people get organized, we should be the prime example of that in our project management. All right, let's look at another incident here. On January 13, 1982, Air Florida Flight 90 tried to take off from Washington National Airport in Washington, D.C. That's now uh, Reagan Airport. It never got more than 350 feet above the ground. It crashed into the 14th Street Bridge and then plunged into the icy waters of the Potomac River. Now, while regulations and company policies say one thing, what pilots actually do when left without checks and balances might be quite different. And in this case, we have fair wars causing companies to hire low, lower cost, inexperienced pilots. And they were very inexperienced with the icing conditions in the Washington, D.C. area. The captain in particular had failed some proficiency checks related to following regulations, checklist items, and remembering critical memory items, and his attitude was seemingly cavalier. So after a long wait in icy weather, the captain of this aircraft decides not to get de-iced again. The voice recorder even reveals the pilots discussing how much ice and snow is out on the wings. The voice recorder also recorded the pilots going over the checklist with the co-pilot calling out for engine anti-ice and the pilot responding off. And it was 24 degrees Fahrenheit at the time or minus 4 Celsius. So he was just uh, repeating what he always said in other conditions. When you hear engine anti-ice, you say off. He didn't think through the scenario. Now, while the regulations at the time said they had too much ice and snow on their wings, they took off anyway. Seventy of the 74 passengers were killed. Four crew members were killed and one was seriously injured. So let's look at the chain of events. First, we have an airfare war, and so the company is saving money by hiring inexperienced pilots. Then the pilots get placed in an unfamiliar environment, and specifically a Cavalier pilot finds himself out of his element. Then the first officer doesn't call out the de-icing procedures that are uh, not according to regulation. Then the pilot himself reverts to a habit rather than the checklist for guidance when setting the engine anti-ice, and he has it set to off in 24 degree weather. And then the first officer was actually the pilot flying at the time, and he was not confident about the takeoff performance, but he continued anyway. Let's look at the transcript. We can see where the co-pilot was registering that the takeoff did not feel right, and that should have been the sole reason for aborting the takeoff. doesn't matter about anything else. If it didn't feel right, if you're a pilot and something doesn't feel right, you're probably correct. Go ahead and act on that information. Now, is it okay for somebody to call out, I don't think this scenario is right. I don't think this client is right for us. Um, I don't think I should be the one working on this project. All of those things. Are those, are those things okay for us to call out? Are the pressures of needing you know, the client's money taking over? Are we all focused on that rather than can we do the project? And we start the project and we're on the takeoff roll and we see red flags, but we just continue with the takeoff because we're committed. If procedures aren't being followed, is it okay to bring attention for that? And is it okay for the new guy to ask big questions about your procedures and your billing and the lack of specs and, and anything else that comes up. And are we specifically saying, hey team, if you sense anything, bring it up as soon as possible. Do you have a place and a time to debrief what's happening with projects and clients and budgets and personalities? And are you thinking right now, who will pay for that? That's a clue as well. So there were procedures and checklists available in that accident, but not followed. There was zero cockpit resource management, training was lacking, and you can always trace that back to money, which was a missing resource for this flight. They had an airplane and a crew and passengers and fuel and all that, but they were missing one more resource, which was the ability to pay for experienced pilots or to pay for better training to convert inexperienced pilots into experienced pilots. How about our industry? How are we doing on procedures and checklists? Now, Portage Bay, we're actually using a checklist app that was developed in-house. 
And from blog posts to SSL installs, anyone in the company can look at the checklist and follow the steps. And if that tool is something you might be interested in, let us know. We'll talk to you about it. What about Cockpit Resource Manager? Is it okay for everyone on your team to call out something that doesn't feel right? Uh, is it okay for everyone to point out when procedures aren't being followed? Training is a big deal. Now, it's we don't have a lot of training in our industry, and a lot of us are so busy trying to get projects done that we don't really honestly set aside time for keeping ourselves trained. Now, depending on who you ask, you'll hear that you need to spend anywhere from 10 to 40% of your time keeping yourself trained and up-to-date on the current state of FileMaker and the industry, and that is a significant investment, truly. But the way it's supposed to work is that that investment will yield a harvest later on of more clients, more money, bigger contracts, things like that. Now at Portage Bay, we, we have ample opportunity for code reviews, and this is where all the devs get together to make a certain code block or process as brilliant as it can be. And everyone learns something uh, from our code reviews. Now, resources are always tight when running any business these days. And of course, without your trip to engage this year, maybe you have some spare money and time to invest in something. So if you've been delaying getting that book or watching that video or downloading trial software, let me encourage you to do it this week. This is a great time to, uh, to take care of things that need to be checked off that have been pending for a very, very long time. Now, let's look at one more accident and then we'll wrap this thing up. Air Midwest Flight 5481 took off from Charlotte Douglas International Airport in Charlotte, North Carolina on January 8, 2003. It abruptly climbed while the pilot struggled to push the nose down. It zoomed to 1,150 feet and stalled, which means the wing no longer had enough air going over them to keep the airplane flying. It rolled to the left and it crashed, killing everyone on board. Now, there were three problems with this flight. First, it was overweight, but the pilots didn't know it. Second, the overweight condition caused the airplane to be tail heavy, and in layman's terms, it means the airplane would have a tendency to stick its nose up once off the ground. Lastly, the controls for moving the nose up and down were improperly rigged and thereby did not give the pilots enough control to fix the tail heavy problem. Now, none of these problems by themselves would have caused the crash. They analyzed this one heavily, and had it just been one of those things, or even two of those things by themselves, uh, the airplane would not have crashed. But since all three were combined together, then that caused the crash. Now, the NTSB found that the weight figures being used for passenger weights were correct by FAA standards, but those standards were created in 1936. <laughs> Passengers no longer weigh 180 pounds each in the U.S. That's probably short by, if not 20, then 40 pounds. So the NTSB also found that the mechanic who rigged the elevator control cables had never worked on a Beach 1900 before, which is the type of aircraft pictured there. They also found that his supervisor did not do the required tests of the control system after the repairs. We still don't know why that happened that way. Now, even worse, the FAA knew about the lack of procedures at that maintenance facility, but had done nothing about it. So there was a it was just an accident waiting to happen, quite honestly. So, questions. How long have you been doing project management the way that you're doing it? You know, sure, it worked when you were a one-man shop, but are those the right procedures for a two-developer team, a five-developer team? Um, how has technology solved problems that you had workarounds for in the past? How many procedures can be simplified because things are better now than when you first implemented your procedures? And what are your procedures for teaching new employees the culture of your company, especially when it comes to client interactions? And how long have you been doing it that way? Do you find business the same way that you always have? When was the last time you reviewed your procedures, top to bottom, to make sure they were all still valid? All right, let's take a look at the big picture here. What does it take to stay safe? The first thing the airlines have that we don't is accident investigation. We really need the ability to quantify and categorize projects that have turned out poorly. And I know there's, there's data on this out there, but just as the FileMaker community, uh, being a, just a little bit different kind of product, I would suggest having a database of those incidents. 
Now, there are at least two human factors that keep us from doing something like that, and that's pride and fear. I don't want anybody to know that I messed up, or I may not get that project if somebody knows that I messed up. Well, to get around that in the aviation world, there is an anonymous reporting system called the Aviation System, uh, or sorry, Aviation Safety Reporting System. And if any pilot or crew member sees anything that's done outside of the regulations, or uh, there was a near miss, or I any kind of incident can be reported anonymously, and the aviation world gets this huge database of human factors causation, and, and it's been incredibly valuable to aviation safety. We can do the same thing for projects. We could have an, an anonymous way to report a project failure, and everyone could learn from it. Training. I mentioned training earlier, and this is a big deal because um, our, our industry, uh, you know, the analogy starts to break down here a little bit because we're not training for the exact same scenario every time, but pretty close. But pilots get in the simulator to practice scenarios, right? They're going to put themselves in weather and conditions and uh, instrument failures that they hope never happen in real life, but we want to get the muscle memory of what would we do in those situations so that we don't have to make a decision in the moment. We simply revert to habit. Uh, based on our training. So, you know, how how can we practice handling different types of project problems in advance? How can we simulate a, f a failing project and learn how to recover that thing? And, you know, we have a we have a cert test for FileMaker, but we don't have one necessarily for project management. I know there are uh, degrees and programs out there for that, but, you know, these all of these airline pilots that crashed, they were certified. Uh, they had their license. But they crashed anyway, because managing the flight and being a pilot are sometimes two different things. So the question I have for us is, should we invent a certification for managing FileMaker projects or clients or project management in general? I don't know. I don't have the answer for that. I'm hoping to spark some discussion out there. And then procedures. Procedures for everything written down. Airplanes have the MEL. You don't take off unless everything uh, is cleared through that book. Uh, pilots have procedures and checklists all over the place. Mechanics have manuals on how to repair things. You know, do, do we even have our processes defined on paper? You know, that would be a great starting point is to just write them down. Here's how we do things. Consistency. The procedure for flying on an airline is the same thing every time I do it. Even if I bring something weird to the table, uh, they have rules about, hey, step off to the side. We're going to handle that in a different way. Um... A client that does three small projects with me should feel like, you know, the next one's going to be old habit. I know exactly how this project is going to go. It's comfortable. Um, I know what to expect. Are there consequences for not following procedures? So if, if your client doesn't communicate with you in a timely manner, are there consequences? If I'm not getting my stuff done on time, what are the consequences? Um, you know, if, uh, if an airline... Let's say there's a flight and, uh, and they lose their radio in mid-flight. What's the procedure for that? Well, honestly, it's continue the flight because they filed a flight plan. We know exactly where they're supposed to be and when. And we can double-check that from the ground as they cross those waypoints. So they don't even need their radio. Um, they can just come in and fly the approach and air traffic control will clear everybody out of the way. And it'll be just fine. There's already, before an airplane takes off, a contingency for... When does the rate? Uh, what happens if the radio fails? We can have many, many contingencies in place already if we think through these scenarios, because we've experienced a lot of what's going to happen. There's not a whole lot new under the sun, so we can come up with our own contingencies for uh, project management. Cockpit resource management. Someone should always be in charge of flying the project, and it's not the passenger. Passengers can tell you where they need to go, but not how to get there. And if the destination changes, in the real world, we'd land the airplane, redispatch the aircraft, we recheck the fuel, we start a brand new flight. It's not even a continuation of the previous flight. It is a new flight. So we have to check to make sure that the flight from where we landed to our destination is safe. Right? So regular, informative communication saves lives. If I have to wait until the captain is in a better mood to communicate to him, we need to land right now. If I have an unruly passenger, we land right now. 
be decisive, communicate, execute. And I tell people all the time, flying is all about making as many good decisions in a row as possible until you either finish the flight or there are no more decisions to be made. And the same can be said for project management. We want to make as many good decisions in a row as possible. So investment. We have to spend time and money thinking through procedures, writing them down, editing them, and printing them. And just like the airliners can decide, uh, or the airlines can decide between, you know, I don't want to replace all the seats with fireproof seats because that's going to cost too much money. I'll just pay it out if there happens to be an accident. There's always a line to draw on what we're willing to do. So you need to find your line. What, what version of procedures is good enough for you? What version of responsibility transfer is good enough for you? And at least write those down so that everybody's clear on that. I really wish I had a magic formula of seven things that'll keep your projects out of trouble. But my real takeaway from connecting these dots is that the only reason that such a monumental effort was put forth in the aviation industry is because lives were on the line. Now, thinking positively, it's because people in the industry cared about making sure passengers weren't killed. But thinking negatively, it's because it costs the airline's business if people are too scared to fly. So they at least have to have the projection of safety, the image of safety, if not safety outright. So what about us? What about our industry? Are we motivated to raise the FileMaker brand to the point where people hear that and say, oh, FileMaker, that's safe. That's, that's the best way to go. You will be happy if you go with a FileMaker developer. I don't know. Why don't you tell us? Head over to PortageBay.com and drop us a line. Give us a comment. Let us know if this helped you at all. And I really appreciate you watching. Thanks for your time.